Like many rivers, the Passaic starts as a pristine trickle. It doesn't stay pristine for long, though. I mean, it can't really. In its relatively short length of 80 miles, the Passaic meanders through the most heavily populated part of North Jersey. If you were to follow it all the way to the city of Newark, to its mouth at Newark Bay, you'd have just taken a tour of one of the most polluted rivers in America. But this isn't the story of starting at the top, where they say a persistent angler can still find a wild trout, nor are we going to pull striped bass from the dioxin-laden sludge at the tidal low end. This is a story about the middle, and a completely manufactured fishery everyone in New Jersey knows exists, but few experience to the fullest. I'm Joe Cermelli. This is Fishing on the B-Side. The New Jersey Division of Fish and Wildlife has been stocking the Passaic with northern pike since the 1990s, and in just the last decade alone, the river has received roughly between 3,000 and 7,000 four to six inch fingerlings per year. You would think then, with so many pike prowling all these juicy log jams and deadfall, getting fat on bluegills and baby carp and such, the Passaic would be flooded with anglers. But compared to other places in the state, it's not. And that's for one very simple reason, piss poor access. The state can try to promote recreational angling on the Passaic all they want with truckloads of pike, but they're dumping them into a river that predominantly flows through private property. And as you might imagine, the places where you can access it, particularly on foot, aren't usually that fishy because they get a near constant barrage of spinners, frogs, and whatever the hell this rig is, exactly. Ten years ago, when my good friend Joe Demoldaris and I hatched a plan at a bar to find out if the pike in the Passaic would eat flies, there was very little information to go on, and we didn't know a single person that fished it. But one thing that makes Joe and I such good friends is our shared love of exploring the unknown and just trying stuff to see what happens. So, when we decided to do the Passaic, we did it the hard way. We poured over Google Maps and just pulled Joe's drift boat up without any idea of what we were getting into. We soon figured out that while a drift boat is good, one with a motor is better because you can't really do a point A to point B float here, and that knocking on doors to ask for access can be dicey in these parts. But we kept at it, logging data on every new stretch, and little by little, we started to figure some shit out. <laughs> <laughs> that fish came with that so hard. There's, there's some big <laughs> fish in here. Yeah. You know, I mean, there's definitely some big fish. There's fish over 40 in here. You know, I know. We haven't found one yet, but they're in here. Joe D is a veteran trout guide and fly shop owner on the upper Delaware River. And because those things keep him so busy, it's rare we get to fish the Passaic together, except during the colder shoulder season. Our obsession with this place is monumental. And even after 10 years, there's still so much we don't know. But what we did learn very quickly is that this is a river of curveballs on many fronts. Watch your ride. The Passaic is not exactly what I'd call navigable. There's no maintained channel, and the vast majority of the Central River winds through soggy floodplains where a stiff breeze can topple trees. That's why we carry a saw, because you never know what obstacles lay around the corner on any given visit, even in stretches that have historically been clear. And if you run into boat trouble back here, well, Boats US isn't coming to save your ass. <laughs> Guy starter. So I mentioned that thing about curveballs. Well, here's how my day started. Oh, is that a pickerel? No. If you're looking for pickerel, you love them. 
but today, wrong Esox. I mean, we'll take it, right? It's a, it's, it's a tug on a cold day. It's also a tug I'd have killed for in, you know, the last episode about pickerel, but it's actually somewhat of an accomplishment. Pickerel are native to the Passaic, but despite all these miles of juicy pickerel habitat, we hardly ever catch them. I'm guessing that's because all those stock pike are dominating the ecosystem, but that pickerel is still a good sign. Quick break so Joe can take some Advil. <laughs> Here we go, I'm gonna go <laughs> Oh, liquid gels, liquid gels. Even in warmer months, it's rare to smoke fish from start to finish. There's always a window, and the trick is being in exactly the right place when it opens. Our hope was that that pickerel was a sign that all the Esox in the river just flipped on the chow switch. Ooh, nice. Fuck, fuck, Mike. Good one? Oh, yeah. Soft, soft. Ooh. <laughs> oh, no. That was a good pike. The Passaic can be extremely fickle, so any missed opportunity here really stings. The trick when it happens is to stay focused because if you believe that window theory, which we do, it's not uncommon for bites to happen close together. The old dragon tail. Not a monster, but it's uh, in the back of his throat region there. Now, before I lose that dragon tail streamer I'm throwing, or better yet, it gets ripped to shreds by several more fish, let's take a moment to discuss the power and the glory of this fly I consider the best pike pattern ever in our super fun and informative talking shit segment. Dang it. The shit that we're gonna talk about today is how a horrible, useless toy slash party favor became one of the most useful streamer materials ever. Originally marketed as Squirmals, the magical pet, these tapered, wiggly chenille creatures featured two googly eyes and a length of monofilament tied off to their tiny little noses. The idea was that you'd use the mono to manipulate the squirmel like a puppet, making it appear to magically slither through your fingers and around pencils and shit. But, I mean, it sucked. It's a shitty, it's a shitty toy. But then, in the early 2000s, a few clever fly tires figured out that if you decapitate a squirmel and lash its lifeless body to a hook, you end up with a streamer that swims and undulates like no other, and that pretty much no predator species on the planet will refuse. The buzz grew big enough that eventually Orvis stepped up to produce squirmels, minus those goo goo eyes and in useful fishy colors instead of Kitty City neons, and rebranded them as dragon tails. Now, a lot of serious fly tires actually kind of hate dragon tails because they kind of dumb down streamer tying. I mean, really all you need is a dragon tail and a little bit of synthetic head material and you're in the game. In my opinion though, this ease of tying is super beneficial when targeting toothy fish like pike that just destroy flies. You can knock out a dozen dragon tails in an hour or less, but here's a hot tip. Go heavy on the super glue at the base of the tail and make sure you fuse the tip of a tail with a lighter. These extra steps will extend the life of your dragon tails, which kind of have a nasty habit of unraveling if you skip them. To be fair, there are ongoing cleanup efforts on this river, particularly at the low end. The central part we're fishing isn't quite as dirty, but still, Joe and I don't eat fish from the Passaic. Floating through pockets of warm air, wafting with the scent of dryer sheets is common here from the discharge of chemically treated water. The buffer zone of floodplain throughout the area is also kind of a lawless dumping ground for anything and everything. And while the pike are healthy, we'd rather catch them again than risk glowing after a fish fry. We should stop and have lunch there. That's our lunching spot. There's already chairs set out for us, Joe. <laughs> Water's been over top of these. Look at the sediment on these chairs. <laughs> you think they're safe to sit on? I don't know, we'll find out. So we're not gonna be eating any Passaic River Pike. So, um, little tip, okay? 
you're gonna get sandwiches made for a day of fishing the night before. It's, it's super amateur to put mayo and oil and vinegar and tomatoes and all that shit on the sandwich because then the next day you got a soggy sandwich. You just, you just kind of got to go, you know, meat and cheese, lettuce. And I don't, I don't have time for, for, for condiments on the side. I hate that, as a matter of fact. Like, there's like 10 little, little cups of shit. We also don't have time for like a super long sandwich break here because although things had gone quiet, we're confident that Passaic has a few more bites left in her between us and the takeout. Plus, Jody still needs to get on the board. Luckily, good things often happen right after lunch. Got some ass. He ran right at me and I saw what he just turned. At just a hair over 24 inches, we'd call this an average pike for the Passaic. And while it might be a peanut in, say, Saskatchewan, the little bastard took a shot at a Saskatchewan-sized fly. Nice <laughs> job. In the clutch. That's a pike. Ain't yeah. the bunker fly. Remember though, bites tend to come in twos here, and with only about a mile left in our float, the Passaic gave us one of those fish you certainly don't see on every trip, but you hope to. That's a good one. That's a good one. Oh, come on. <laughs> Woo! That's a good one. That's the one. That's a good one. There's a lot of other places in the country, Canada, where 30 inch fish would not be that big a deal. But when you consider we got this fish, a stone's throw from the city of Newark, New Jersey, in one of the most populated parts of the entire country, this caliber fish right here is what keeps us coming out here all winter long. So we're clear, this is not a cry for help. We're not gonna save the Passaic and turn it into some destination. I mean, shit, I wouldn't stay in a motel anywhere around here. It's always going to be an urban river flowing through the hustle bustle of North Jersey. And if I'm being honest, it's the grunge that gives it its character. Every year I see more and more Passaic Pike videos pop up on YouTube and more people get interested and that's okay. The state puts these fish in this river to be caught and Joe and I would be very sad if they stopped doing that. I would just add, if you're gonna explore it, watch where you step, wash your hands frequently, and carrying some select spare parts isn't a terrible idea. Let's see how many fresh dings and chips Joe put in the prop today. That's Not the one, terrible. No, it's the one thing about this river though, you gotta, you gotta eat props up. <laughs> you bounce off enough wood, but not too bad today. It's still good, still got a few more swims out of it. So. 